Hello and welcome again to Why Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, brought to you by the UCD Center for War Studies. The papers in this panel examine armed conflict and the military as elements in political strategies. Our next speaker is Jonathan Matthews, a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In this paper, Jonathan will examine how members of Zionist militias in British Mandat Palestine developed radically different understandings of the political opportunities created by the Second World War. How could radicals such as Abraham Stern conceive of an anti-British alliance of Nazis and Zionists as a viable strategy? And what did Ireland have to do with this? More on this in Jonathan's talk. Hi, good evening. I'm Jonathan Matthews. I'm from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I'm very happy to take part in this conference of Why Fight? And I want to contribute my part in discussing the story of the revisionist Zionist militias during the Second World War and how do they confront the question of fighting the British while at the same time understanding that the Nazis pose sometimes a greater threat or whether they do understand this concept. I also want to talk about how the Irish story of independence very much influences revisionist Zionist, militant Zionist movements during the Second World War. And first of all, I have to explain what revisionist Zionism is, is, revisionist Zionism is. It was created as a political party within the Zionist movement by Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky, who believed that the creation of a Jewish army should predate the creation of a Jewish state. He believed that the way that, um, to create a Jewish state goes through an army. And this is where he contrasts both from socialist Zionism, where he himself um, also believed in free markets and a very um, liberal political um, views when it comes to economy, and also from mainstream Zionist politics led by Chaim Weizmann, who believed that through um, international relations and diplomacy, a state for the Jewish people could be achieved. His base was in Poland, and it was a very militaristic organization. In 1920s, Jabotinsky was not very um, popular, you could say, within the Jewish population of Palestine. It was the golden moment of the Jews with the British um, colonial authority control. But this changes at 1929, after the publication of the second white book, which came as a result of the um, 1929 riots that ended with 133 dead Jewish um, citizens and 116 of the Arab population of the countries, approximately. The Jewish population of Hebron was liquidated after hundreds of years. And this shocked very, very much everyone in the Zionist movement. Within the revisionist ranks, a uh, militant movement was gradually being formed, led by Jabotinsky, it's called the Irgun Hatzvei Haleumi, very commonly known in English as the Irgun, which demonstrates um, Jabotinsky's idea of a militant organization, an army that will predate the existence of the state. This is where you could say the breakaway moment of revisionist Zionist policies from mainstream Zionism, where they physically create their own militant movement and also create their own political organization later on. Even within this relatively right-wing movement, we have the extremists, those who were called the Gang of Thugs. Two of them I want to mention here, Abba Chimeir, and the other one, a poet called Uri Zvi Grinberg, which very much brought the Irish story to inter-revisionist Zionism, into the militant movements, the Irish story of independence and the Easter Rising. Their disciple of these two was Abraham Stern, which in, 19, in beginning of, who in the beginning of 19, and second, 1939, beginning of the Second War, splits away from the Irgun. And the reason was he disagreed with the policy of not fighting the British during the Second World War. Now, we need to understand that the, that the revisionists were always flirting with Ireland. On the one hand, they really didn't appreciate the concept of partition, and um, Jabotinsky considered it as a complete failure. On the other hand, he, dread, he meets with De Valera in 1937, and he sees a lot of um, common grounds with him, specifically with Eamon De Valera. It happens during the Peel Commission, which was supposed to give some sort of plan for Jewish-Arab relations in British Mandate Palestine. And it's for the first time the British talk about partitioning also um, British Mandate Palestine to having a small Jewish country on the coastline of the country and um, a large um, um, Arab country. On the, and most of the country, which is a very different plan for what will develop 13 years later, but or 10 years later, sorry. But um, Jabotinsky is horrified by the plan. While mainstream Zionist politics, led by people like David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Sharet, Shertok at the time, 
try to negotiate with the British and find a common ground with the British, he goes to de Valera, who already voiced himself as one of the key, key opponents against any type of partition based on Irish lessons. So we have here de Valera as an opposition against the British. We have here Jabotinsky, who is against the British plan, but also in opposition within British and within Zionist polities. And they meet together, and this is brokered by a person called Robert Briscoe, who himself was a gunrunner for Sinn Féin in the early 1920s. Later in 1950s, he would also be the Lord Mayor of Dublin and one of the few Jews in Sinn Féin. And he had another role. He was the chief of the Revisionist Party in Ireland and perhaps in the whole English-speaking world, or at least in the British Isles. But this small meeting in, of, of the opposition, um, so we can say the opposition is very much described also in Kevin McCarthy's biography of Briscoe, who orchestrated this meeting or brokered it, is a small phase. Because in 1939, the, the example of Ireland gradually shifts. So from a political idea of Jabotinsky trying to be the future leader, this is his shot at being the leader, or perhaps being what de Valera was for Ireland, a group of people already started adopting, within the Zionist militant ranks, start adopting a more violent approach. And this is also inspired by Ireland. In Hamashkif newspaper, 19, March 1939, there's already a whole, a, uh, um, a whole column discussing the story of Roger Casement. Now, we need to imagine that by the time it was already in the events leading after Czechoslovakia, leading um, towards the Second World War. So the looming war and the possibility of Britain fighting Germany reminds the Mashkif, the writer, of that event in 1916 with this SS out, the German ship, um, where Roger Kaysen arrives with an armed shipment from Germany to help the East Rising. And this is an interesting moment. What are we hinting at? That perhaps not, not the Germans should be the enemies of the Jews, but the British? Well, this is a debate that exists and leads to the breakup of the, of the militant movement of the Irgun. The majority remain loyal to the decision in 1939 to support the British in the fight against the Germans, believing that rightfully that Nazi Germany is far more dangerous to Jews than Britain is. But a splinter group of around 700 led by Abraham Stern creates his own movement. They're called the Stern Gang, that's a nickname. They're called themselves the Lochamei Chirut Israel, which means the warriors or the fighters for the independence of Israel. And already the name indicates a change in their approach no longer a military organization, no longer let's say compared to kind of no IRA, but let's do kind of an Easter Rising group, a small group of fanatics or hardliners within the militant Zionists have taken example from the Irish case study. And how do we know that Ireland plays a key role? Because already in the first newspaper, um, first underground newspaper or magazine they published called Bamakhteret in the underground, um, the second page gives a translation or part of a translation of a book which was translated by Stern of Patrick Sarsfield of Hegarty's the victory of Sinn Féin, where it discusses why a small group can do a revolution. Now, it's very interesting that Stern, who was one of the most hardliners within Zionist politics, adopts somebody who is, in fact, in Irish context, um, pro-treaty, you know, pro-free state, Kermin Agadeel, um, party member, or Haggerty. But we need to remember, they don't really understand the inside politics of Ireland. For them, Ireland is an idea, and the idea that justifies their cause, first of all, to continue fighting the British, as the Irish did during first, the First World War, and also the idea of the small movement, revolutionary movement. It justifies the fact that they're not following the path of Jabotinsky. What did Jabotinsky have to say about it? Well, he gave them a small gift by dying, so he couldn't say anything against it, to be honest. In 1940, he dies. So it kind of leaves the movement, the revisionist movement, without a spiritual leader or without a political leader for the next three years. Stern himself also gets killed. But perhaps two events that happened in 1940, 1941, demonstrate his approach and had two attempts to reach with Nazi Germany through, um, through a delegate went to Damascus and hoping to reach Istanbul, um, where von Papen, the German um, consul was, with um, the op proposition of perhaps co cooperating together against the British. And this is absurd because the second approach happens in December 1941. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in after June 1941. That means after the killings already take place in the Soviet Union. First of all, it demonstrates that they may not necessarily know exactly the detail, but the fact that the Second World War is absolutely absent here. This is no longer, this is not yet a war between Nazism and the West or democracies or liberalism in the world, but it's typical war like World War I where the Jews should keep out if it's not their business, which is, by the way, not the mainstream 
um, policy of Zionist policy, politics, and even not of revisionist Zionist politics. But Stern, as I said, get, got, get killed, and it kind of destroys the movement for a while. Two people, however, appear in 1943. They're going to change and, and, and I've seen radicalize the movement. Within the Stern gang, which, as I said, Stern is no longer alive, comes Yitzhak Shamir. He's one of the triumvirate leading this movement. And he calls himself Michael as an underground name. Why Michael? Michael Collins. Which is again funny, because considering the same story of O'Hegarty, if Shamir would have been an activist in the Irish cause, probably he would be the one shooting Michael Collins. But again, demonstrates that Ireland becomes an idea, a concept. Where does this concept come from? What we know, we don't really know how it really reached. But what I discovered when I was sitting in National Archives of Ireland that the Talbot Press, the one, for example, publishing the books of Patrick Sarsfield or Hegarty, sent the books in 1928 to the Talbot Publishing House in Jerusalem. Talbot Publishing House is under well, the, the house itself that looked into the address, and it's the man who lived above it was Uri Zvi Grinberg, as I said, the spiritual father or the teacher of Stern. So perhaps this is a connection. But gradually, the Irgun also radicalized itself. And in 1943, it ends the ceasefire with the British under the direction of the new leader, Menachem Begin. Also, both of him and Shamir, which I mentioned, became later prime ministers of Israel in the 70s and the 80s. But in the meantime, they are the smaller group. They're definitely not dem they don't demonstrate um, mainstream Zionist politics. And there's kind of a competition between the Irgun and the, and the Stern gang, or Etzel and Lehi, who are going to carry um, the, the torch, the flame of rebellion against the British. And you can say that the success in the beginning comes with the Stern Gang. Two activists, Eliyahu Hakim and Eliyahu Betsuri, managed to assassinate the Lord Moyne in Cairo in a huge, perhaps a huge surprise. Now, most of the people within the Zionist movement are absolutely horrified from this um, act. But in fact, the people involved in the killing whether it's Shamir or Nathaniel Inmo, one of the triumvirate who led in this, or very much ex exalted this victory, was so happy about it. And we can see it in the leaflet they publish, where they write, a nation of 40 million plays the tyrant to 400 million people in India, a leech that sucks the blood and fattens from their breasts. After 30 years of poverty and exploitation, the Indian is destined to die so that the English exploiter could live well and long enough to enjoy his old age. And when the Indian revolts, he cries at us, and does not want to comply with, with his destiny given to him by his tormentor. When the Indian demands the right for freedom, then the English will treat him with guns and a bloody massacre. Machine guns will harvest the silent demonstrators. Hundreds will go to jail and some to the gallows. And it continues. Is it only Asian nations that the English control in this manner? We still remember the Irish affair. It happened in our lives. The British colonials starved the Irish people, a European nation, a Christian nation, the British regime did all it could to annihilate the Irish people in their country. Many died in famine and plague. Hundreds of thousands were forced into exile as a result. And when the Irish went to fight against the oppressors, what were the tools used by the English against them to prolong their control? Machine guns and prisons. A murder under those pieces of laws and order, law and order. The best of the Irish youth were murdered by the black and tans and many brought to the gallows. This was perhaps the last real success of the Stern Gang, the killing of the Lord Moyne, when you can consider it a concess. I'm talking about it naturally from their perspective. And it also demonstrates their concept of resistance against the British, which is very much taken from um, this idea of small groups doing it, um, um, almost a suicide terrorist activity, and then brought to the gallows. The gallows plays an important role in that idea they're trying to bring from Ireland. Again, what we're not talking about, that it's still World War II is ongoing. And they're living in a parallel reality in one of the safest places for Jews in the world during the Second World War, British Mandate Palestine. It is as if the war didn't exist and 1930s gradually continued to the 1940s without no major change in world scenery. And also when Begin comes back in 1940, when he comes back, he reaches 1943. We need to remember that he, even though he began the war in Poland, he was taken by the Soviets under the rear drop Molotov Pacts into the gulags with the army of Anders, where he was a soldier. And he reaches um, British Mandate Palestine in 1941 um, and 41, 42, and there um, he's released and he's allowed to continue um, his political goals now quite independently. And he also incorporates the Irish story, but he does a slight, a small change. We don't fight as a small group. 
we continue our militant organization, Ireland becomes a symbol of national rebellion. It becomes a spirit, a pathos, not an example that we need to take step by and case by case. And we can see how it penetrates also Irgun activists of Shalom Chaviv, for example, who was executed by the British for trying to break into the Akko prison where some of his um, um, movement members were imprisoned. Um, after this, uh, uh, the British court sentenced him to death, he gives this political statement. When the Irish rose against you, their land was colored in rivers of blood of those fighting for the freedom. You have hanged, you have murdered in the streets, you have deported to lands of sorrow. In your arrogance and stupidity, you thought that like brutal persecution, you will end the spirit of resistance of the free Irish. You were wrong. The Irish rebellion lasted until Ireland was free. Now you stand amazed that the Jew, whom you considered a coward, who was a victim of centuries of massacres and programs, has now arised against your army. Alas, he is unafraid. He ridicules death himself and he will be hanged. Now, this is an interesting phase. We, we can see here that this gradually changes. Now, we, we need to remember mainstream Zionist movement did not really support the Irish. We can see it in, well, support the Irish, but not support the concept of adopting Ireland. It did believe that this had to be more in a leading way, more in use of politics and diplomacy. Nevertheless, um, they took control also of the whole movement and they succeeded. I mean, the mainstream Zionists succeeded in creating the state. So, in fact, the militant Zionists were not able to achieve their Irish goals, even though the goal itself of Jewish independence here has been achieved. And we can see that something doesn't work when it becomes mainstream. In 1950, um, De Valera comes to Israel and he visits through the brokerage of, again of the same Robert Briscoe, now Lord Mayor of Dublin, and the Rabbi Herzog, who was the chief, Ireland of, um, chief rabbi of Ireland. And they meet Ben-Gurion in a dinner at his home of Herzog. And Briscoe wrote in Zari how they had a very nice talk but they didn't talk about religion or politics or about the experience, but about mathematics. And he said, neither Ben-Gurion nor De Valera discussed something about their experiences or their expectations for the futures. And then, he, and then he summarized, it was a very nice evening. I think this is a big demonstrate of how uh, the demonstration, once the goals were achieved, then the roots of both Jews and Irish go in different directions. And in fact, in many, in many cases, conflicting directions. Um, when you think about the development of um, political politics today between Israel and Ireland, which to say the least are not the best, um, perhaps the worst in Europe when it comes to Israel. So, but it does demonstrate that the Irish played as a role model for a very specific type of Zionism. And it is done in the context of the Second World War and it raises a question, who are we fighting? What is our goal and who are our, really our enemies? Now, if you have any questions, Actually, this is done online and it's pre-recorded, but I'll be more than delighted to answer any question that may arise either now in the group Q&A session or if you email me. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a pleasant evening.